There is mounting research that companies that are female-led perform better than male-led companies. Sure, while that sounds like a boost in the arm for female leadership, it might be an even bigger boost for investors. Joining us now for more on what this means, in New York City, Susan Myers, Director at Barclays Capital, and with us here in our Toronto studio, Sarah Kaplan, Professor of Strategic Management at the Rotman School of Management at U of T. Susan, welcome to the program. Sarah, welcome back to the program. Thank nice you. to have you both here. Thank you. Sarah, let me begin with you. So there have been a couple of highly publicized um, studies that companies with female CEOs, board members, senior leadership perform better than those companies that do not have women in those ranks. What do you attribute that to? Well, it, it's been actually nearly 10 years since Catalyst first came out with this uh, study and others have replicated it showing that women on boards, women, lead, uh, women led companies tend to perform better than companies that have less diverse boards. Um, and that's mainly been based on US data. In Canada, TD Bank has uh, recently kind of replicated that work and shown that basically the same results in the Canadian context as well, although maybe more sector specific, where in extractive and mining industries, we see the effect more strongly than we do in consumer products. But basically the effect is holding in Canada and, and in the U.S. Um, and uh, th they, they claim this correlation between performance. Now, that we can't say that there's causation. <laughs> it's not like women are on boards and therefore they are forcing companies to perform better. All we can say is that there's a relationship there. It could be just that very well-run companies uh, attract more women. And so there's we can't necessarily make a causal claim. But on the other hand, uh, investors shouldn't care about causality. Investors, as, as you pointed out in the introduction, just are interested in, in making money. And so a correlation should be enough. And uh, unfortunately, we don't see a lot of investment products out there that are taking advantage of this data, even though it's been out there now for almost 10 years. Okay, we're going to talk about some of those products in just a bit. But Susan, um, let me ask you, uh, uh, Sarah says, you know, we don't know exactly the cause. We know the core, we, we know the effects, though. What do you think we can take away from reading into that companies that have senior leadership with women do better? Yeah, Sarah did put it quite, quite elegantly. For an investor who's looking for returns, what you want to figure out is what is going to indicate returns. And investors look at myriad calculations, indicators, ratios to determine which companies are likely to outperform and that's the ones they invest in. This data has been out there for a long time and we recently launched a product on it, but surprisingly there has not been many that say, oh, look, this is a this is an interesting indicator in terms of correlation. The causation, yes, I'll let the academics try and figure that out. But in the meantime, it still seems like a good basis on which to form an investment strategy. All right, I want to bring uh, Jackie Vanderbrug into our conversation from Boston. Jackie's Senior Vice President Investment Strategist at US Trust. Jackie, hello. Hello, I nice think, to be with you. Thank you for being with us. I know we were having troubles connecting with you on the line. Glad you can join us. Um, what do you read into that companies that have senior female, uh, females in senior leadership are doing better? So I think you have to look at this at a, a slightly more macro level. And, and we talk about it, you hear the term womenomics bandied about, but we really are seeing um, the fact that women's growing economic power is transforming the world. And so if you look at this aspect, both in terms of companies that have women and more women in leadership are going to be able to win that war for talent when more women have advanced degrees. They're going to be able to understand the growing female consumer dollar, 85% of the consumption in the world dictated by women now. They're going to be able to address um, other factors in terms of a team performance and the fact that we know that teams that are more diverse make better decisions. All of those pieces intersect to lead to you know, a, an understanding of why you would want to look at companies that have diverse leadership or more women in leadership. Okay, here's the problem though. So we know the evidence is there. You get more women in positions of power, your company, your investors mm -hmm. do better. And yet, Sarah, when we look at Fortune 1000 companies, I think 51 of them um, are led by women. What's a, why, why aren't we doing better? Why aren't we doing better? Well, there's so many long answers to that, to that question. I would say a lot of it comes down to implicit bias. Uh, in m most of us, 
don't think of ourselves as sexist. We don't wake up in the morning saying, oh, let's try to discriminate against women. Certainly companies are feeling more and more pressure to increase the, the diversity in their organizations. And yet somehow this bias just keeps playing out. And, uh, and even whether it's inside companies or in the investors, we're seeing this as well. There was a recent study that came out of Harvard that basically showed sometimes when uh, women are added to boards, institutional investors are actually divesting of their investments. Be they, there's this sense somehow that the contributions of women are devalued, and there's lots of ways that that can happen. Hmm. Jackie, what do you what do you want to add to, to that point, which is that you know this is supposed to do good for the bottom line, and yet when we look at the the, the playing field and the evidence on the ground, we just don't have enough women in these positions. I think Sarah's right that there is this aspect of implicit bias and, and researchers show over and over that this is not actually just a bias of men, right? That, that women investors will make the same decisions that um, a prospectus put in front of a woman and a man but um, read by a different voice, both women and men are going to choose to invest in the company um, in, the, in the male voice there. So we, we have this aspect, and I think what we take from it is that um, we need both men and women, Sarah and I write often about gender capitalism, this aspect that it takes all of us to look at this and say, how are we going to bring um, all of the resources, all of the talent, all of the possibilities of the human race together to solve the challenges that we have today? Let me push back a little bit, Sarah, because um, given the numbers, we have a small sample size um, from which to, to, to draw from. We have so few um, female-led companies. Can we then, uh, given that the sample size is so small, draw any real conclusions? Well, this is something that academics have spent a lot of time thinking about, and I think it is absolutely true the sample size is very small. We have a lot of small numbers. We can't we can't completely tell yet, but there are enough, at least in the United States, companies that are led by women or companies uh, with uh, boards that have some women on them. Again, it's not a great percent, uh, but enough that there have been some uh, more rigorous statistical analysis that's basically been able to show uh, that there are changes in performance when women are introduced to the board or when women are in leadership. But we're still early days in that research. I think. We're stronger in the domain of correlation than we are in the domain of really understanding these, these effects. And um, I think the fact that there are now a few investment products out there that are focusing attention on that is going to lead investors to actually put pressure on companies to improve their uh, statistics, and then we're going to have more data. Okay, we're going to talk about those products because both um, uh, Susan and Jackie have them, but let me stick yeah. with you for a second, uh, Sarah, and just give us the overview. So there's something called gender lens investing. Right. What the heck is that? <laughs> well, it may be a little bit of an awkward term, so let me unpack all three of the words. Um, maybe let's start first with the word investing because that's what we're talking about. So investing is any way that capital can be deployed. Um, so it could be me investing in a mutual fund, it could be a company investing in a product, uh, it could be venture capital investing in a, a startup. Um, and then the second word we should pay attention to is the word lens. Because a lens, think about the glasses that I'm wearing, it affects how you see the world. And so when you talk about a gender lens, what you're saying is let's see the world in a particular way where we can uncover opportunities that we haven't seen before. And because of this implicit bias we were talking about before, we tend, we don't know that we're seeing the world through a gendered lens, but we are. We're seeing the, wor the world in a way that devalues the female contribution. And so what Investing with a gender lens is meant to do is to say, let's think about gender, not just about women, because men and women are both involved, as Jackie pointed out, and let's think about all the ways that moving capital could change the equation. So why is it, for example, that only 6% of venture capital money goes to women-led businesses? 6%. Uh, it's only 6%. Why are there also only about 6% of partners uh, in uh, venture capital firms are women? Uh, very few women in the leadership in the hedge fund world, uh, in private equity. Um, so the people giving capital and getting capital, they don't seem to be women. How can we fix that problem? How can we think about 
uh, directing capital and companies towards products that would benefit women and girls. For example, it's only recently that car companies have started testing uh, uh, their vehicle safety with crash female size crash test dummies in the driver's seat, as if somehow women weren't driving before. You mean before they were in the passenger seat? Yeah, they, they would put women in, but they were in the passenger seat, and only recently have they started to put them in the driver's seat. So, and that's another way you allocate your capital, your money, your investment to choices in different ways. So investing with a gender lens has this very big umbrella to consider all of those different things but one of the aspects of it is thinking about the ways we can move capital to in, increase diversity in, in companies and um, the products that uh, Susan and Jackie uh, are, are involved with are ones that are actually favoring those kinds of behaviors. Okay let's talk about those products. Susan um, you have a product it's called uh, Women in Leadership Exchange Traded Note WIL. What is that? Well, I'll talk about the index that underlies it, uh, the Women in Leadership Index. Well, we, we launched it last year. It looks at U.S. headquartered New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ listed companies. It applies a basic liquidity filter, and then it ranks all of those companies by gender leadership, where female CEOs rank first, and then it goes largest to smallest percent women on the boards with a floor at 25%. We then take the top 10 ranked companies in each of the 10 GIC sectors, and that's what comprises the index. We market cap weight it with a maximum weight of 5% for any one company. And every quarter, we do it again. So that, you know, sort of what does that come out looking like? Well, in theory, it would come out to be 100 companies, because I said we'll take the top 10 in each of the 10 sectors. Unfortunately, right now we have 83 companies in the index um, because some of the sectors can't come up with 10 companies that have a female CEO or more than 10, more than 25% women on their board. Um, and again, that fluctuates a little bit quarter to quarter as companies change the makeup of their boards and change their CEOs. Um, but that's um, where it's been for the last, sort of around where it's been for the last couple of years. Um, why did we do it as a market cap weighted index? It's really, it's a, this is, a basic U.S. equity exposure. Um, the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted benchmark index. And we sort of said, we want this to look a lot like the benchmark, right? So Sarah mentioned investing. It's about your returns. It's about what you do with your capital. Um, there's sort of two sides to why people might invest in something like this. One is you're investing for returns, right? So this product is designed to say, okay, if, you, if you're looking for equity type returns, equi U.S. equity exposure, this index gives you that. The other thing that more and more people care about in their investments is what values does it represent to you? What is the implication of your investment? And in that way, this product gives people the opportunity to invest their values that companies should have more gender diversity on their boards and at the CEO level. Well, investing in a, in a way. In a sense, yeah. I, it's not co-investing in, in a traditional someone is investing alongside of you sense, but it is a, a way of speaking with your purse, right? It's not philanthropy. It is definitely an investment, and you know it, it is meant to fill a certain purpose from an investment and returns standpoint. But it gives people that additional opportunity to add the layer of speaking through your investment about gender diversity. Okay, so it's been about a year. You said you started this about a year ago. How's it doing? How's it performing? It's performing exactly as expected. Um, we launched in July of last year. Um, and looking historically, we said it should, you know, if you look over a five-year his back-tested history, um, it outperform the S&P 500 by about 1% per annum. And it's continuing in that around 1% off of the S&P 500 rate. Um, again, I'm not saying I think women only outperform by 1%. It has to do also with the design of the index itself. We, the way we designed it, it should match quite closely to the performance of the S&P 500. Okay, Jackie, U.S. Trust also has a product. It's called, uh, I think if I've got it right, Women and Girls Equality Strategy Wages. That's what it's called? Correct. Okay, how does this one work? So the wages product is actually a separately managed account. And um, to what Sue was saying, if you think about U.S. Trust as a, a fiduciary asset manager, so we are not in the business of ethically losing anyone money, right? This is absolutely a product that was intended for 
investors, institutional and high net worth individuals um, who are looking for risk adjusted returns. In fact, we designed it in conjunction with the Women's Foundation of California, uh, a nonprofit organization that as a fiduciary where they're looking to uh, for their investments to make money so that they can give grants away, absolutely is looking to maximize their returns. Okay. So, um, so our, thesis, our thesis is that companies that are thoughtful about engaging women as leaders and as consumers and as agents of global change are going to have an advantage over the long term to be able to have very strong performance. So how we put this together is in three stages. First, we take a look at the S&P 1500, and we look at a whole host, 400 different factors, and we rank, again, by sector, how they are on things like um, pay equity, how they are on women on boards, how they are in advertising towards women, whether they um, procure from companies that are led by women, whether they do business in countries where women are not even sit not uh, able to vote, they're more considered property, et cetera, et cetera. So we do first rank order and take the top quartile. Then we actually take a look at fundamental research, whether or not at this stage in the business cycle this is a company that you want to own. And then we actually optimize back to the benchmark. For us, that's the S&P 1500. Um, so it's an all cap strategy. The performance uh, over the last two years, so this is a product that was launched January 1st, 2013, so we have two years of data, and we outperformed the S&P 1500 by 350 basis points. Hmm. Okay, sir, I want you to underscore this point that both um, Susan and Jackie made. This is not about charity, this is about right. boosting your bottom line. Right, I think for a long time when people thought about investing with your values or ethical investing, there was some idea that you had to compromise on returns. And I think the point that both Susan and Jackie are making is that these products are designed not to be sort of, well, we want to help women out, so we'll give up a little in returns. Each of their products is performing above the benchmarks that they've established. And I think this is, the, the point is that there are huge opportunities investing in uh, these gender strategies precisely because gender has been, women have been devalued in the marketplace. And so there are these pockets of value that only now we're starting to see products pick up. So we have the two products that we just heard about from Barclays and U.S. Trust. In Canada, actually, we don't have anything yet. Um, Nothing. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, that, I think that, again, Canada's a smaller market. I think there are companies that are looking to Canada right now, but it's not there yet. Yet. In the U.S., there's a few other strategies. Um, there is a mutual fund that retail investors can invest in, PAX Elevate, um, that uh, Sally Krawcheck, who used to be at Citibank, is now involved with. Um, there's some other that high net worth individuals can get in involved in. Uh, Eve Ellis has a product at Matterhorn Group at Morgan Stanley called Parity Portfolio, but again, that's not accessible to the retail investor. So there. I mean, I have now just listed basically all of the products. So, so you can count them. <laughs> you can count on, them on, on one, one hand, hand. On one hand. And yet, you know, from from, from what all three of you are telling me, right. this is just like win-win. And we are. Last time I checked in 2015. So why are we still at so few? I think it comes to uh, the issue that for some reason. Uh, and the reason I will say is implicit bias, but w th that g gender is devalued, that somehow gender has not been seen as material in the investment community. And uh, if it's not material, people don't pay attention to it, they don't measure it. All those wonderful metrics that um, Jackie was talking about that they use at US Trust, those are data that many of which are just simply not available, that they are having to develop on their own. Uh, we don't even have the data to be able to follow these strategies. We're beginning, this, this, there's, we're at a starting point, and if you don't have the metrics, then you can't do the investment strategy. And so we're just missing a lot of pieces. And, and, and it comes back to this uh, point that, that we've all been making about, uh, about the devaluing of the female contribution. And, and one example that Jackie brief, brief, briefly mentioned, but I'll just flesh out a little bit more, was a recent study that has more to do with sort of the venture capital world, but is very salient here, uh, where they put 
uh, two uh, equal PowerPoint documents with investment prospectus uh, for a startup business in front of a whole bunch of investors. And in some, they Men had- Men and women investors. Male and female okay. investors. Uh, and this was an experiment, so this, you know, they took the same prospectus. They had some narrated by a female voice and some narrated by a male voice. And, uh, and the narration, the text was identical. So we're talking about identical business uh, prospectuses, and the only difference was the voice, male or female, and the investors were twice as likely to invest in the prospectus narrated by the male voice than the female voice. And so that, I mean, you can't assign that to anything but bias because everything else was identical. Mm -hmm. And so if we see it in those kinds of things, we're basically seeing it everywhere. There's something about the female contribution that we uh, uh, have devalued. And what's so brilliant about what US Trust and Barclays are doing is they're saying, this is the hidden opportunity. We're gonna go after that. Other investors are not. This data's been sitting on the table for 10 years and we haven't gone after it yet. Okay, Jackie, but the problem is, is, I mean, how do you convince people if this is an unconscious bias? And yes, there are a few products, including yours out there. I mean, how do we fix this? How do we convince more people that this is the way to go? So Meredith, I think there's two different pieces to this. One is um, what Sarah was just saying that at some level, um, performance will speak for itself, right? So uh, we oftentimes, when we talk to investors about this, you can cover up the aspect of women or social and just talk about the performance of the strategy um, and talk about the characteristics of the strategy and then you know the, the, the data and the opportunity speaks for itself. So that's one. The other side of it is that um, we are increasingly understanding the fact that the so-called non-financial factors, um, these factors that are environmental, social, and governance factors that do include this aspect of diversity and equal valuing of both genders, that those are material, that those are factors that are going to contribute to things like safety records, to things like talent retention. And all of those are economic factors. So as we are in this shift of understanding in the investing world of the materiality of these factors, um, investors are coming along. Last point, and maybe a, this is a third, um, is that women and millennials are leading this conversation. We do a lot of research. We have a, a study every year, uh, US Trust Wealth and Worth. We found that one out of every two, so 50% of investors said the social, environmental, or political impact of their investments was important to them. This is no longer niche. This is not the tree huggers, the Birkenstock wearers, one in two. Interestingly, when you unpack that, women are 50% more likely to say that than men. And millennials are the most likely. So 72% of millennials will say, I will take increased risk for uh, a social return in addition to my financial return. Okay, so we're making, we're making headway w w with the next generation. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, 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 Susan, weigh in here. I mean, how do we get around this unconscious bias? How do we mitigate that in the real world? Yeah. I I think there's an opportunity here for a, a virtuous cycle, right? So we're saying, Jackie and I, that is, are saying, okay, here's an investment product that takes advantage of the fact that gender is an indicator of high performance, and yet it's not being valued as highly, and therefore you have an opportunity to take advantage of that. It's an arbitrage opportunity, let's say. Um, as people make money on this and see the results, um, people will say, oh, it turns out it's true. Gender, do, gender diversity does make a difference and it does lead to better performance. I should invest in it more, which over time creates incentive for companies to say, hey, wait, we want to have better performance. Why don't we have gender diverse leadership? What are we doing that's causing us to be below the standard and what is now kind of a low bar in terms of gender diverse leadership. Um, and should we be doing something different for our own benefit? It's a, there's a concept called shared value um, introduced by Michael Porter out of Harvard, um, which talks about companies 
doing things that have social good, but not because they have social good, but because they're the right thing for the company and will cause the company to perform better. And I think that we will reach a point in this dialogue where companies will realize it is in their best interest to embrace gender diverse leadership. All right, Sarah, we only got a couple minutes left. So not enough women in senior leadership roles. We are seeing a small, uh, you know, making our way in gender lens investing. What more can we do? Well, I think if we think just about getting women into leadership in companies, there are all sorts of practices that uh, are out there that are not really being put in place by many organizations. One of the most important, you know, most companies think, well, we'll just do some diversity training. It has just been proven that doing diversity training alone is simply not uh, effective. There's a, you need to put in more practices and more policies that support that. So one is aligning incentives so that you actually give incentives to the organization to improve its diversity. And the other is changing how you recruit and retain people, how you evaluate performance. I mean, just like I described uh, the study that showed the two different business plans, there have been many studies of when you submit two different resumes to a company, identical resumes, but one with a female name and one with a male name, the, ma the one with the male name gets more callbacks than the one with the female name. So we can think about all sorts of ways to mitigate against that. Um, we know, for example, in uh, orchestras, uh, there used to be very few women playing in orchestras. Then they started doing blind auditions where people would audition behind a screen. And once you got people auditioning behind a screen, you got better results. In fact, it, they couldn't just be behind a screen because people were recognizing the footsteps of men and women's <laughs> shoes. So they had to be behind a screen and without shoes on in order to really get the effect. But now we have women are 30 or 40% of orchestras. So, adding in some procedures that are gender blind is really helpful. And then where you can't be gender blind, you and I are talking to each other, we know that we're both female. Um, so then how do you mitigate against that? Some organizations are starting to put in review committees that actually check for gender bias in uh, performance uh, and hiring decisions, and that's actually making a difference as well. I want to thank all three of you. Um, this is a good conversation, and I hope that we have added to uh, this conversation by the four of us talking. Jackie and Susan, thank you for joining us from Points Abroad, and Sarah here in the studio. Appreciate it very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.